What's going on guys? It's True from Nerds New Sexy Entertainment and here I am with that SNES review as promised. I know it took a little longer than I wanted it to get out, but this is for our new show, Press Start to Continue, and I hope you guys enjoy it. What's up you sexy nerds? This is your boy True from Nerds New Sexy Entertainment here, and as promised, I'm going to review the SNES Classic. Now, this is going to be a quick synopsis of the system and a few thoughts on the games that were released alongside with the console. And in the spirit of it being a mini SNES, call this a mini review for these games too. The Super Nintendo Classic released September 29, 2017. I was lucky enough to get my hands on one a few weeks later. I took a day off from work to follow up on a rumor that Toys R Us was going to be having them in stock. I was lucky enough to be joined by my brother and there was very few to go around. Ten, if I'm not mistaken. At any rate, you may be asking, is this worth spending the retail price of $79.99 for? Or even going as far as to buy one off the internet for double or even triple the price? Well, as Reggie fils the president of Nintendo America says, don't give in to that and just keep trying your luck. I personally believe that it's definitely worth the sticker price, but I'll show you more about the system and let you decide for yourself. This console brings back the taste of the 90s gaming of 20 classic Super Nintendo games and the inclusion of the never officially released in the US Star Fox 2. When booting up the system, you're given the option of what language you wish to have the system. You can customize how you want the games to be displayed while playing. There's a sort button to organize your games to your preference, your reset button on the console which actually suspends the game so no more leaving your system on in order to keep your progress, or if you're one of those quote unquote evil pirates, using ROMs and emulations for save states. Well, that's pretty basic as to the interface, now let's talk games. Oh man, here we go. Konami was one of the heavy hitters in the 90s with amazing gems like Sunset Riders and TMNT4, Turtles in Time. Contra 3 The Alien Wars released April 6, 1992. This game improved greatly from the first two entries in the series. Set in the futuristic year 2636, the alien invaders that were defeated during the previous installments have decided to launch a full-scale war against mankind on Earth, starting the Alien Wars. Unlike the previous Contra games for the NES, the futuristic setting was kept for the American version. However, the identities of Bill and Lance, the original Contra heroes, were changed to their descendants, Jimbo and Sully, maintaining the continuity of the previous localizations. Likewise, the alien invaders were once again changed to the Red Falcon. Now being able to hold two weapons, you can save that favorite gun for sticky situations. One hit and you're gone still. And unfortunately, the classic Konami code does not give you 30 lives like in the original. There are many innovations such as the top-down perspective. This was known as Mode 7. This is where the background of the screen could rotate to generate the feeling of depth in games. Contra 3 is an excellent game for the console. Grab a friend and get ready to cuss like a sailor while playing this game. Before the horrible divorce of Nintendo and Rare, they brought us a masterpiece known as Donkey Kong Country. I have fond memories of being a child and playing this on a demo SNES at Walmart. Released on November 21st, 1994, this is a huge step in graphics. This was one of the first mainstream games to use pre-rendered 3D graphics to give DK a surreal look. It does show its age, however, but this is high-tech in the mid-90s. Donkey Kong is an amazing platforming game. You take on the role of DK, and in his debut on this game, Diddy Kong. DK and Diddy are tasked to go retake the Banana Horde from the evil King K. Rool. Bonus points if you get the pun on his name. The soundtrack for this game is a quick favorite of mine. Donkey Kong Country was a huge step in the right direction for this franchise, spawning two more sequels for the system and eventually giving us an N64 title. But that's for another video. Give this game a try and I'm sure you'll have a great time. Oh man, this game surely is a cult classic. Earthbound, or Mother 2 for you purists out there, was released in the US on June 5th, <coughs> my birthday, <coughs> 1995. Written by Shigesato Itoi, the writer for My Neighbor Totoro. You take on the role of Ness, also known as that random kid from Super Smash Bros. on his quest with his newfound friends, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh, to save the world. <laughs> Pooh. This game didn't do so well stateside, some say because of the sarcastic ad campaign for its release or just its simplistic looking graphics. I remember renting this game from the video store, which I hope most of you know what those are. You had to put a $25 deposit, but that's because the game came with a strategy guide and with scratch and sniff cards. Those damn things were some of the raunchy smelling things known to man. I'll be the first to admit, this game doesn't bring anything new to the RPG genre, but this game is just one of those you're meant to enjoy. The story crosses from comedic to sometimes depressing. I truly believe this is a game you have to experience for yourself. Another gem with its soundtrack, it's definitely one of those games you gotta give a shot. Satire and all. Final Fantasy 3 or 6 as it was officially named in the series. This game, this game right here, probably one of my favorite Final Fantasy games, if not my favorite. Released October 11th, 1994 here stateside, it was met with great praises for its story and gameplay. Game designers out there might remember an old podcast that we did mentioning Chrono Trigger being the blueprint to making a great RPG. Well, here's the greatest way to make a cinematic opening for any game just by following Final Fantasy 6. And if you're not familiar, here's a quick reminder, check out Nerd is a New Sexy Podcast, new episodes every Sunday. Check your local Facebook page for more info. I'm sorry about for the plug for the podcast, I'm a shameless self-promoter, so yeah, sorry again guys. Anyways, back to Final Fantasy 3. This game starts off with two soldiers and a young woman in Magitech armor walking towards a village that you only hear briefly about, followed by that music. 
that music. Nobuo Uematsu is probably one of the greatest living legends in composing music of all time. An active time battle system mixed in with a little strategy on how to plan your attacks, this game eases you slowly into understanding the mechanics. In a world where magic is so taboo and forgotten, you take on the role of many characters. But starting off as Terra, a half-esper, half-human. In her quest to figure out who she is and where she fits into this mad world after being a slave to the Empire. I don't want to give away too much on this since it's just that amazing. Give it a play for yourself if you're a fan of the Final Fantasy series. Besides from that, what game do you know where you can suplex a train? F-Zero was one of the launch titles for the Super Nintendo and was the first to show off Mode 7, as told in the Contra snippet. Taking place in 26th century Earth, these deadly high-speed races are held by wealthy space merchants. Many enter for their own reasons, though they're all after the goal of the F-Zero Championship. Filled with obstacles and traps, these racers risk their lives. The ones that become accustomed to it demand harder challenges, and the ones that don't, well, unfortunately, they perish. This game takes a little getting used to, but it did have several sequels released in later generations, which are pretty cool to come by, but they're still hard as hell. So if you're looking for something in the old racers, give this one a shot, though I'm not too much of a fan of it. But hey, to each their own. Kirby's Stream Course takes the joys of mini-golf and adds its own unique twist. You're tasked with defeating enemies first in order to earn stars. After all enemies are eliminated, the goal opens up. This game is one of those ones that can cause you and your friends to fight with one another and probably throw controllers. There is skill and luck involved in this game. You can at one moment be on your way to victory and the next moment you run out of stamina and your turn skip. Sadly, there isn't much of a story on here, but I have a feeling they make up for that in the next game I talk about. But if you're looking for something to kind of uh, troll your friends, why not give Kirby a shot? It's pretty fun. Kirby Superstar Saga released September 20th, 1996. This is more of a traditional Kirby game. The great thing about this one is it allowed up to two players simultaneously. You would copy an enemy's ability, such as Beam, then you could spawn a partner giving them that power you just copied, and also giving you control for either the second player or the computer. Their avatar becomes the enemy sprite and now has control of its various abilities. This game also had multiple campaigns contained on it. They also took the arena from this game, which was a gauntlet against bosses and enemy scenarios, and did something similar to the latest Smash Bros. release. So, if you're a fan of Kirby, be sure you check it out. It's definitely one of those ones that's really great to play. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past released April 13th, 1992. Does anybody else feel as old as I do when I mention the dates of these games? This game is usually on people's lists of must-plays, and I tend to agree with that. If you haven't played a traditional Zelda game before, I'll break down the formula for you. You play as a courageous young man, or on occasion, a child, who happens to be the chosen hero meant to protect the Triforce and save the land of Hyrule from the evil clutches of Gin. I won't spoil the plot more than that in case you haven't had the chance to play this game, which if you haven't, stop what you're doing right now, give me your nerd card, go find it, whether it be online or borrowing it from a friend, and just give it a playthrough. Also, if you're a mega fan like I am, you can always pick up the comic that was originally released in the Nintendo Power magazine. I warned you guys, super nerd right here, Legends of the Comic. Mega Man X released in January of 94. See, I'm not naming the date specifically now. This version of Mega Man, which is known as the X model, was the first time the Blue Bomber made it onto the 16-bit console. The funny thing about X, though, is he wasn't even supposed to be the main character. Keiji Inafune, the creator, wanted Zero to be the main protagonist. That idea was changed due to the uncertainty of how fans would receive a new-looking Mega Man. Zero was then moved to a secondary main character, and eventually would become playable in X3, and then a full campaign dedicated to him in future releases after that. Anyways, you take on the role of X in his mission to stop the Maverick invasion led by one of the best Maverick hunters gone rogue, Sigma. X introduced new mechanics on top of the traditional gameplay of gaining enemy abilities. These new mechanics included refillable energy tanks, heart tanks to increase your maximum health, and capsules to give you abilities such as a dash or taking less damage. Mega Man X is definitely one of my favorites, and it's one game I can always recommend to anyone. Secret of Mana released in October of 93. This game takes the traditional RPG game and turns it into what we know now as the action RPG. In this world, there's a power known as Mana, an ancient technologically advanced civilization exploited Mana to construct the Mana Fortress, a flying warship. This angered the world's gods who sent giant beasts to war with the civilization. The conflict was globally destructive and nearly exhausted all signs of Mana in the world until a hero used the power of the Mana Sword to destroy the fortress and the civilization. The world began to recover in peace. 
As the game opens, an empire seeks the eight mana siege, which when unsealed will restore mana to the world and allow the empire to restore the mana fortress. The game begins as three boys from the small Patos village disobey the elders' instructions and trespass into a local waterfall where the treasure is said to be kept. One of the boys stumbles and falls into the lake where he finds a rusty sword embedded in stone. Guided by a disembodied voice, he pulls the sword free, inadvertently unleashing monsters into the surrounding countryside of the village. The villagers interpret the sword's removal as a bad omen and banish the boy from Patos forever. So, if you haven't played this yet, there is a remake coming out on the PS4 this year, so give it a look. Star Fox released stateside for us in March of 93. This on-the-rail shooter was Nintendo's first use of polygonal graphics thanks to the Super FX chip. It's even displayed on the box that it's using it. The game has you take on the role of Fox McCloud, an ace star pilot, and his team of Slippy Toe, Baco Lombardi, and Peppy Hare, who General Pepper of the Cornerian Army hired to fight Andros in his invasion of the Lilat system. Being an on-the-rail shooter has you constantly moving on a track firing at pretty much everything humanly possible. At the end of each level, there's a boss that has very few vulnerable spots to shoot at in order to take them out. This game was a great choice for the classic system. There are several sequels out there on the later generation consoles, but this is the route for Star Fox, and it's always a treat to revisit the classics. In August of 93, Street Fighter II Turbo had made its way stateside to the SNES. This took the already popular franchise and did some balancing and made it the quintessential game for tournament play at the time. Street Fighter revolutionized fighting games, and without it, we wouldn't have the 2D fighters that we have today. Some of the alterations made in this edition are E Honda's 100 hand slap, which can now move forward, and Zangief can now lariat through projectiles. I have to give a shout out to my buddy Cody. We call him Commander Lariat back in our fighting days. If you want to know how fighters got to where they are now, you should give this one a shot. Just be sure you have a buddy to play with, because the computer can be boring sometimes. Super Castlevania hit shelves in the US December 4th, 1991. This is the fourth game in the series, but it's a remake of the first game. You take on the role of Simon Belmont to venture through 11 levels to defeat the evil Dracula. This game got the controls down right. You have better control of the whip, you actually feel in control when you're jumping. Everything about this game just feels right. The music gives that spooky, yet uh, pumped up vibe. If you don't believe me, you should hear this game's edition of Bloody Tears. It still has wall chicken for health and that weird currency is hearts. I gotta remind myself that at times when I first start, since you're so used to hearts restoring health. Can you brave through all 11 levels and beat Dracula? Give it a shot and just enjoy this gem of a game. Super Ghouls and Ghosts hit stores November 28, 1991. This is a sequel of Ghosts and Goblins. You take on the role of Arthur to save his girlfriend slash princess. This game is one of my mains. I never beat it. I just can't do it! Okay, seriously, I cannot stress this enough. This game is hard. I don't like it. I can't get past the first level, regardless of how hard I try. And believe me, I've tried. But, you know, it's just one of those things that it makes you want to throw your controller against the wall, makes you want to throw the TV against the wall, makes you want to throw everything out, light it on fire, and just be done with it. Okay, sorry about that. A little nerd rage is sadly one of those things we all experience. Alright, let's just move on. Sorry about that, guys. Super Mario Kart made its debut September 1st, 1992. Successful barely scratches the surface of this game, selling over 9 million copies. It's easy to understand why, though. This game gave us the arcade-style racer. It spawned several sequels and even a drinking game. Please be responsible if you're going to attempt that game. If you're unfamiliar with the Mario Kart series, I'll break it down for you. So you pick your racer. They vary in weight and speed. You have four races to compete and earn points per race. During the race, there are ramps and speed boosts that can make or break your momentum. You collect coins to hit your maximum speed, then there are the power-up boxes. These items are meant to either boost yourself and or hinder other racers from getting the coveted first place. This game is one of those ones that you need to have a second player to play with, or at least a whole group, because it's just that much of a party game. It's fun. Give it a shot. Okay, nerds, this gem of a game came out in May of 96. Super Mario RPG is the love child of Nintendo and Square. It took the already established franchise and gave it a new style. So there really isn't anything new to start the story off, hanging out with the princess and Bowser comes and kidnaps her. We've seen this a lot, so Mario rushes to Bowser's keep to go save her. You enter the keep and fight the baddies, though not in the way of a traditional Mario game does. The battle system is simplistic but keeps you active with the timed hits and timed defense. 
the music in this game is top notch, taking some of the old tunes and giving them a fresh flavor along with the new music. So you make it to Bowser, fight him with Peach giving you some advice in the battle, defeat him in all his right world. Suddenly, a giant sword sinks into the castle and Mario is blown back home. You return to the castle only to have the giant sword destroy the bridge to Bowser's keep. So your new quest is to save the princess, but is Bowser really the antagonist in all this? Also, what was with all the stars being spread through the world from where the sword entered? I won't spoil anything else for you on this. This game is certainly great, usually on people's top 10 lists for these SNES RPGs. The writing in this game is clever, and I would recommend you play this game if you haven't. And if you have, go play it again. It's a treat. August 13, 1991 saw the release of Super Mario World here in the States. I know we've heard the same old story from the franchise, Bowser kidnaps the princess and Mario must venture to go save her. Moving over 20 million units, it's easy to see why people call this one of the most successful games in the franchise, but also of all times as well. I don't particularly think the story's bad. This time, instead of being in the Mushroom Kingdom, they are now in Dinosaur Land. This was the first game to introduce Yoshi. He would go on to have his own franchise and become a welcomed addition to the Mario series. Just like Super Mario Bros. 3, this has an overworld map and different paths to go to get secrets and maybe finish the game a little faster if that's your goal. This may not be where Mario began, but this is one of the best controlling games from the 90s. Besides, who doesn't love our little Italian plumber? A quintessential game for the Super and its SNES classic little brother. Super Metroid hit store shelves in April of 94. This game featured our ass-kicking female protagonist, Sammy Saran. P.S. I'd love a woman who kick my ass. Brownie points if you get that reference. The team from the two previous Metroid games were brought back onto this project, taking two years to develop this finely tuned gem, it's a great addition to the Metroid series. The game opens up with the retelling of Samus' previous adventures on the Game Boy where she came across the Metroid larva, which imprinted upon her the role of mother. Samus takes the Metroid from the planet SR388 back to Space Colony Ceres, where the scientists believe they can find a way to harness the Metroid's power. Samus leaves it in the care of the scientists, and soon after she receives a distress call from the planet. Big surprise, right? Leaving a creature of amazing power in the hands of scientists is going to, of course, attract unwanted attention. Enter Ridley, the one responsible for the death of the scientists who Samus attempts to apprehend and sadly fails. Samus follows Ridley to planet Zebus. I won't go into more of the story since the game is just too good and the ending sequence is awesome. Besides, I got to have something to talk about when I do the full review, right? Now here's a secret for you, I do enjoy the sport of boxing. I mean, I even use Little Mac as my main in New Super Smash Bros. Super Punch-Out came out September 14, 1994. You take on the role of a nameable boxer, I still call him Mac, in his career in the WVBA, or the World Video Boxing Association, to become the champion. Here's a fun fact, did you know that Charles Martinet, the voice actor for Mario, provided voices for the announcer and some of the boxers in this game? Some returning boxers come back in this title, such as Bald Bull and Super Macho Man. You take a behind-the-view seat of Little Mac and learn the patterns of the boxers, trying to figure out when you can counterattack. Button mashing might get you through the first few fights, but take heed, some of these boxers are tough. They have their own little quirks, such as a Bob Marley knockoff, or a Mexican wrestler. Also, some of these fighters will use dirty tricks, such as spitting in your face or even throwing balls at you. I've gone through this game several times. i even gone through the original Punch-Out as well. Anyways, even though Iron Mike isn't in this game, give it a try. Also, if you want to truly beat the game, you need to go through the first three circuits undefeated to unlock the last four fights. Okay, nerds, I got a confession to make. I've only beaten Mike Tyson twice, and they were both by decision. But have you played this game? Kai will mess you up. And the way I look at it, win's still a win, right? But does it count in your guys' eyes? Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, debuted October 4th, 1995. Is anyone else noticing a lot of Mario on this console? I mean, it is Nintendo. This game is a sequel prequel. I know that's confusing, but pretty much it's the next game in the series, but takes place before the others. Surprisingly, this doesn't feature Bowser kidnapping the princess. No, my nerd friends, this actually has Luigi being captured by Kamen. See, a stork was carrying the brothers to their parents, and sure enough, that evil D-bag decides to intercept them and only manages to get Luigi. Mario falls from the sky and onto Yoshi's back. The Yoshis take it upon themselves to reunite the brothers and make sure they get home to their parents. The game looks like a storybook for children, and that's because Mr. Miyamoto wanted the game to go in that direction for the art style. He preferred the hand-drawn stuff in comparison to the pre-rendered stuff in Donkey Kong Country. Yoshi can throw eggs, ground pound, and flutter kick, as well as transform into vehicles, which I found quirky but awesome. Also, some of the people get annoyed with this, but I don't think it bugs me as much. When you get hit, you let go of baby Mario. He starts to cry and a counter begins to go down. If it reaches zero, Mario is captured by Kamek, and you have to restart from the last checkpoint. 
The music in this game is just catchy and great. I won't spoil the ending, mainly because the last fight is pretty awesome. And besides, as I said before, I gotta have something to talk about when I review the game, right? Give it a play. As a little kid-esque as it may look, the game handles great. Well, that's all there is for the system, guys. I'm sorry for the delays in between everything going on with the Nerd's New Sexy Entertainment and starting this show. So, if you're going to ask me what I thought about it... Okay, I know you guys are wondering. I was super interested in this game, and I can't not talk about it, right? So, it's even advertised on the system, Star Fox 2. We never saw an official release of this game. So, unlocking the game isn't hard at all. You just need to beat the first level Star Fox. Sure enough, Star Fox 2 is unlocked. So there's a lot of speculation as to why this game was never officially released. The game was finished, but with the launch of the N64 and plans to release a new Star Fox game, the game was inevitably cancelled. And instead of porting it over, the executive decision was made to do a clean break and revamp the series. So this game's a little different than its predecessor. When I say that, it's because it's not an on the rail shooter. Instead, you got a free roam, similar to all range mode in the N64 version. There are some real-time strategy aspects to the game as well. You have to decide on what you should focus on, protect Corneria from squads and ballistic missiles and even a dragon-like mini-boss, or make a beeline for Andros and stop him. You take on two pilots in the Star Fox team, and they have introduced not only new ships, which can transform, but two new characters. Andros, after suffering his defeat, has decided to launch an all-out attack on the Lilat system, and sure enough, the mercenary group known as Star Fox, also led by the man himself, or where to be Fox himself, Fox McCloud has been hired to fight for the Cornerian army. So here we go again, time to take on everything and eventually stop the evil monkey Andros. So for being the first time playing this game ever, I would totally give it a thumbs up. It's like playing an early build of Star Fox 64 in its all range mode. If you're a fan of space shooters or just gotta get your hands on a never officially released game to see what you're missing, well, you're in luck. Give this game a shot, it really deserved to have come out back in the 90s, but it's a welcome addition to this console. Alright nerds, so that's all there is for the SNES Classic. For the $79.99 asking price, it's something I would totally buy again. I mean, there's some games on there I don't enjoy, like F-Zero and Ghouls and Ghosts. But even then, there's a bunch of people out there that enjoy those titles. So if you want to get lost in that nostalgic feeling, then go pick one up. Just don't feed those pirates more of your hard-earned dollars. Just go looking for it and be diligent. You'll come across one. Now, I know there's rating systems out there, and I wouldn't be able to call this a review show without one. I don't like number systems, so instead, I'm going to go ahead and give the console a... Oh, nergasm! Ah. Oh. Well, that's all for today, folks, so be sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, maybe if you liked what you saw, leave a comment, and if you hated it, leave a comment, make me cry a little bit inside. And if you want to be in the know of the next thing that comes out from us here at Nerd is the New Sexy Entertainment, maybe give us a subscribe. Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to go and try and pass the first level Super Ghouls and Ghosts, because, let's face it, a bit of a masochist. All right, here we go. Damn it, still can't get over this. Nope, nope, get away, get away, damn it! All right, well, you know what? Now I'm running around in boxes again. It's kind of like my life. Gotta get the bag of money, get, yes. Get, oh, oh, God damn it! I've seen this screen way too many times. All right, let's try this one more time. Jump, haha, <laughs> got it this time. Oh sweet, a treasure chest. Pop that open, or attempt to. How am I supposed to... Okay, duck. There we go. Oh, sweet. Bow and arrow, and I'm just going to start throwing. This might actually work for me, but we'll see. And... Damn it! Whoa, watch out. Look. Damn it! Okay, get that stupid dog. Get that stupid dog. 